Hi everyone, uh, my name is Aaron Smith. Welcome to my first video on my YouTube channel, talking mostly about the Battle of Gettysburg and the Gettysburg area, um, York County, Adams County. Um, I don't want to just focus on the battle, though there will be plenty of videos from the battlefield itself, but I want to focus a lot on more of the unknown stories surrounding the Battle of Gettysburg, the days leading up to and the days after July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm really hoping that you guys will get a lot out of this. I know there's a lot of channels on YouTube that discuss the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War and stuff like that. So if I want to try to get some more of the interesting, untold, maybe even unknown stories about the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, so thank you so much for watching. Um, it's a pleasure. I think we're going to have a really good time. We're going to learn a lot. Um, I am not a professional historian by any means. Um, I would hardly even consider myself an amateur historian, but nonetheless, I have a passion for the battle, I have a passion for the Civil War, and I want to share that with you guys. Um, today, I am in the village of Farmers, Pennsylvania. I'm on Locust Lane, right off of Route 30. And for those of you who know the lead up to the Battle of Gettysburg, General uh, Ewell's Corps, they actually marched, um, part of their march was to York, Pennsylvania, and further up to Carlisle and uh, Mechanicsburg as well in that area. So we are actually on the trail of Early's division um, of Yule's Corps. I do apologize, I'm filming right off the road so if there's any loud vehicles that pass by, you may have some difficulty hearing me. Um, it's a little bit of a cloudy day here in central Pennsylvania, but a good day nonetheless. I think the rain has stopped and we're gonna have a great video here. So directly behind me, this small farmhouse here in this little hollow, Directly behind me in this farmhouse at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, um, specifically June 27th, June 28th, that time frame, um, this would have been the farmer's post office. Now, why is this building so significant? Well, this was actually the headquarters of Brigadier General um, John B. Gordon. And he uh, had a brigade of Georgians, and they were camped in this area. So if you imagine at the time, all these fields probably would have been covered in tents for about 1,800 men. Not a small brigade by any means. Um, a pretty sizable brigade, especially in the Army of the um, Army of Northern Virginia. Um, brigade, uh, brigadier General John B. Gordon's Georgians, cars passing. John B. Gordon's Georgians um, were one of the lead elements of Early's division on their way to the city of York. And that's really what I want to talk to you guys today about, is the surrender of York, the largest union, municipality, town, city, what have you, to surrender to the Confederates in the Civil War. And it's actually a really, really interesting story, and I'm really glad to be able to share it with you guys today. So, John B. Gordon. Gordon is headquartered in the Farmer's Post Office, this building right over my right shoulder. Um, and the people of Pennsylvania at the time, they know the Confederates are invading. You have um, Governor Curtin, he put out this emergency order for you know, as many militiamen as possible. And there's, there was a, a lot of uh, hesitation on the part of the Pennsylvanians to react to this order. Um, they were curious. You know, there's some confusion. Are we state militia? Are we federal troops? Of course, the different bounties and pay structures varied for each one. Um, so it was a lot of hesitation and not a lot of people reacted to that call to arms by Andrew Curtin, even though at the time they had about 75,000 Confederates bearing down on their homeland. Uh, cars got passed very shortly. They about 75,000 Confederates bearing down on their homeland, their home state. Um, a very lackluster response. Uh, actually, Darius Couch was the leader of the um, Department of the Pennsylvania there, and they split that into two different departments. You had the Department of Pittsburgh, um, I actually think it was the Department of the Monongahela, and the Department of the Susquehanna, um, covering, of course, the west and the eastern parts of the state. So there's a really lackluster response. They got about 12,000 um, volunteers at that time. And the funny thing about that number is only 4,000 of them were actually Pennsylvanians. 
Um, New York actually threw their neighbor to the south of Bone and gave us uh, 8,000 volunteers to help in the defense of Pennsylvania. Um, there was rumor that Robert E. Lee was going to march toward Pittsburgh and they were building breastworks in the streets of Pittsburgh. Um, you know, everyone in this area of South Central Pennsylvania, Adams County, York County, a lot of them were fleeing to the east to Lancaster, Philadelphia, um, larger cities out to the east of the state. Um, but regardless, we're not either to the east or the west. We are right smack dab pretty much in the middle of Pennsylvania here in York County. So, John B. Gordon on June 27th. June 27th, a local businessman from York by the name of A.B. Farquhar, who actually had ties to the Lee family. He had attended um, school down in Virginia, in Alexandria actually, with some members of the Lee family and, you know, had, had some strong ties to the South as well through his business dealings and whatnot. He heard that the Confederates were on their way to York and partially wanting to protect the town, partially wanting to protect his own business interests. Um, he is going to ride out from York to Abbottstown, a distance of maybe 15 miles or so. Abbottstown is the very, very far east of Adams County. Um, he's going to ride out there to Abbottstown, and he's going to meet, actually, with General Gordon. And they're going to discuss what the Confederates want, what the terms they want for the surrender of York, um, to assure that, you know, there is no burning of the town as the rumors were going through uh, the Pennsylvania farm country at the time that the Confederates wanted to burn the town and steal all the horses and all this kind of stuff. Um, they did steal horses, of course, um, but they, they, they gave the horse owners, uh, you know, Confederate script. They gave them receipts, some Confederate IOUs and Confederate dollars, um, which were essentially useless, um, worthless. They had no use for Confederate money in the North. They were using Union money down in the South. So, <laughs> um, but nonetheless, they gave them um, the Confederate script and whatnot to pay for everything that they took. Robert E. Lee gave his soldiers strict orders. I believe it was uh, General Order Number 171, 172, um, not to partake in the wanton destruction of property and to make sure that um, everything they do take is accounted for and receipts are given. Um, so on and so forth. So, June 27th, Farquhar is going to ride out to Abbottstown, discuss the general terms of the surrender of York with Gordon. Um, and those terms, they, uh, the city of York, especially the town committee on safety, which is um, this town council, if you will, that they came up with when they heard of the invasion of the North by the Confederates. Um, Basically, the town council was very uh, concerned with a peaceful occupation. They didn't want these rebel soldiers running ragged through the town, you know, stealing the women and enslaving the children and yada, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, so basically, the terms that the town council of uh, the town committee of safety wanted, um, they wanted a peaceful occupation. They didn't want to, um, they didn't want any burning of the town. And, you know, Gordon said, all right, that's reasonable. However, I want all state militia in the town to evacuate immediately. Um, and you're going to owe us, you know, so many pounds of butter, so many pounds of bacon, so many horses, supplies, stuff like that. So many hats, so many shoes. Shoes was an important thing, you know. You have to think these men have been marching um, for the past month or so. You know, the Gettysburg campaign started in, in uh, Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. And so they've been marching all the way from central Virginia for the past two months, essentially, since the Battle of Chancellorsville ended. Um, and the interesting thing about the shoes, and, and uh, when I do more videos about the Battle of Gettysburg, I'm going to talk more about the shoes, because that's this huge point of historical tension. Um, but you have to look at the, how the roads were built. Um, in Virginia, they had these kind of soft dirt roads that are really, really easy on the feet, easy to walk on. Whereas the north, many of the roads, especially in Pennsylvania in this area, the roads were macadamized. It was kind of that, kind of like a gravel road. You know, if you've ever walked out on a gravel road in your bare feet in the summertime or even stepped on a Lego in the middle of the night, you know, you, you can imagine how that feels. And, and to walk on that for hundreds and hundreds of miles, it takes a toll on your feet. It takes a it takes a toll on you, especially in in that 
May, June heat when it's starting to get real humid and sticky and nasty, especially in this area. Um, we're a slight upgrade above the swamps of Washington, D.C. and Maryland in the summer, but not a whole lot. Um, so anyway, they want a peaceful occupation of the town. The feds say that's fine. We want supplies, horses, we want $100,000. Um, so Farquhar acted on his own, met with Gordon, came back to the town council of safety, the town committee of safety, and said, hey, you know, um, I know you guys didn't really say I could, but I met with the Confederates, and they are um, willing to keep this very peaceful if we give them, you know, $100,000 in cash and all these supplies, and the town council was like, well... I mean, we didn't really want you to do that, but we don't have any defense, so I guess that's probably the best deal we're going to get. So on June 28th, the Town Committee of Safety, led by Chief Burgess David Small, um, who was a copperhead, he was a copperhead at the time, they're going to ride out and discuss the terms officially with John B. Gordon at this house right over here. Now this is private property. I'm not going to go further up to the house. It's uh, Labor Day. They're probably chilling out, enjoying some Labor Day activities. So I don't want to disturb anyone. Um, but I'm at a pretty safe distance here. Um, but you know, they're gonna ride out to this house, discuss the terms of surrender. From June 28th to the 30th, they're gonna occupy the city of York. And the city of York was actually a pretty, had a pretty interesting political makeup at the time. Um, yes, there were some unionists, there were some Republican sentiments. There was a Republican newspaper and a Northern Democrat newspaper. And York was actually a hotbed of Copperhead activity as well. You know, there's Northern Peace Democrats. Um, and David Small was a Copperhead himself. Um, and his surrendering of the city to York was a really, really contentious issue for the city for many years. For even the 150 some years after the battle, the city of York still very much had this stain of shame on them for surrendering to the Confederates. And, you know, it's said that when the Confederates marched in the town, you know, the people realized that they weren't going to burn the city anyway. They essentially surrendered their city without a fight. Um, some some funny kind of uh, more personal stories about the surrender of York you had the Knights of the Golden Circle and uh, these people were in town uh, representing the Knights of the Golden Circle if you will and it, it, they talked it up to be some sort of mysterious southern organization like the Freemasons or something like that and so these very enterprising less than honest um, <laughs> less than honest businessmen, uh, rumored to be from New York City, of course, where, you know, that's the home of all less than honest businessmen, let's be real here. They're from New York City, they came into York, and they sold these people these Knights of the Golden Circle cards, and they said, you know, if the Confederates are trying to steal your property, just present this card to them, and they'll know that you're one of them, and you support them, and they'll leave you alone. So a lot of these people got swindled into buying these cards for who knows how many of dollars probably a fairly significant sum at the time let's face it when people are fearful they're willing to pay a decent price for peace of mind um so they are sold these cards and when the confederates march in the york and, and wagons and supplies and stuff a lot of these people are presenting their cards and these soldiers are laughing at them they are having a good time laughing at these yankees presenting these cards that they <laughs> it's worthless to them it's it's uh it means nothing to them um actually in this book here i have in my hand excellent book about um some of the things in york county history during the civil war in general uh, the dogs of war are missed civil war perspectives from york county pa um, by local historians james mcclure and scott mingus excellent read highly recommend it pick it up at your local civil war bookstore um, I believe for the historian and Gettysburg has a few copies of this and some other Scott Mingus works um, also Amazon as well um, if you excuse me I'd like to flip to the page showing the Knights of the Golden Circle ticket and, and essentially showing you what they were presenting to um, a lot of these Confederate soldiers who were laughing at them and it's actually said that 
a few of the Confederates said, wow, we really appreciate your support, so you really won't mind us taking your horses, right? Thank you so much for supporting our cause. Um, um, so the Confederates, they go into York and they actually they take thousands of dollars worth of shoes, hats, food, supplies, and they get about $28,600 in cash, far short of the $100,000. However, Jubal Early, he is very pleased um, with the donations from the kind citizens of York. Um, and actually this book, very interesting, has a, um, has a list of receipts of all the people that donated of their own free will to the Confederates. Um, that was later published by the Republican newspaper, I want to say in 1865, um, toward the end of the war. Um, I, I have to imagine there was some sort of dig at those who freely gave their money to the Confederates um, by the Republican newspaper. Um, like I said, it was a Confederate bluff. They never wanted to burn the town. They never had any intentions of burning the town unless the town provided some sort of resistance. Uh, Jubal Early wouldn't have a fascination with burning down towns. Um, probably until Chambersburg was burned down late in the Valley Campaigns of 1864. Um, and I always like to joke around that the burning of Chambersburg was the best thing that ever happened to that city. <laughs> um, it's actually quite funny that there's a Confederate account of them reaching Franklin County. Um, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's during the Gettysburg campaign, I don't mean to hop back and forth. But they reach Franklin County and they say that the, the women of uh, Chambersburg are the, the ugliest and homeliest we've ever seen in our lives or something to that extent. Which is funny, as a local Pennsylvanian, you know, uh, we like to pick on each other, pick on our surrounding counties, and then, uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Franklin County, um, you'd have to be there to understand, they end up being the butt of many jokes. Um, so, on June 28th to 30th, the city of York was occupied by about 6,600 Confederate soldiers, of course, that was Jubal Early's division. Um, the same day that the city of York is being surrendered to the Confederates at this farmhouse behind me, about five, six miles um, north of here on the other side of Route 30, um, which was of course not Route 30 at the time, it was the York Tenth, like York Road, what have you. Many road, uh, went by many names. Um, Jubal Early was actually dining at a home in Big Mouth, and, um, excuse me, let me find it here. I should have bookmarked it, but I didn't. Um, but yeah, he, he dined with the Widow Zinn at a town in Big Mount. Um, she said to Jubal Early, she explained, Are you going to destroy us? Are you going to take all that we've got? Early calmly reassured her, No, madam, and to give you the best protection possible, I will stay with you, with my staff, and no one shall trouble you. He directed his staff to take possession of the property, stating that the porch would do for sleeping. Uh, Early then rode southeast four miles with a small escort to give Gordon his final instructions about entering York the next day. He did not return to Big Mount until 9 p.m. and then discovered that his staff had already eaten supper. However, the old lady had saved a very plentiful meal for Early with about 15 varieties of food, including various meats, vegetables, coffee, and milk. While he was eating, Widow Zinn, no longer fearful, was instead very talkative. She gave Early a good clean bed, and the well-fed general enjoyed an excellent night's sleep. Um, actually, on my way here, I drove by that house. I, the only reason I didn't really film there is there wasn't a great spot to pull off and park and talk a little bit to you about that. Um, car's gonna pass. People are so friendly around here. Love it. Love it. Um, but. Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult place to park and, and, and really get a good feel to talk about without looking like a weirdo more than I already am filming in the middle of the field. Um, regardless, a lot of these stories are, I find really interesting because everybody, when they talk about the Battle of Gettysburg, they think about the 20th Maine on Little Round Top and Devil's Den, Pickett's Charge, and Winfield Scott Hancock, and, and you know John Buford, and all these great heroic stories, and I feel like Many people don't know the stories that led up to the Battle of Gettysburg, the Confederate march, um, the Pennsylvanians' response, uh, the Pennsylvanians' surprisingly apathetic response to being invaded. Um, that's probably the part that most surprised me about doing 
a lot of research and reading a lot of what I've read, um, Coddington describes it really well, just the um, apathetic response to the Confederate invasion of the North. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the city of York at the time had about 8,600 people. Um, those Confederates would be in town from, 20, from June 28th to the 30th. Um, they would then move on on the 30th to Wrightsville, which is where the people of York County really put up a, an incredible last-ditch effort to defend the homeland. Um, they had some volunteer troops of freedmen at the time that fought. And Gordon's troops surrounded the city of Wrightsville in defense. The people of Wrightsville and the militia that were there, they created a horseshoe-shaped defense around the town, um, which put up a good fight until Gordon was able to get his 20-pounders, his 20-pounder uh, parrot guns in position on top of a hill overlooking the town. And he was able to bombard the town. Now, the city of Wrightsville, um, which would be a great video in and of itself, uh, is right on the Susquehanna River, and there was a mile-long covered bridge, the longest covered bridge um, in the Union, actually, at the time, um, going to the east into Lancaster County there at Columbia, I believe, is what's on the other side of Lancaster County. I don't know. I don't get out there very often, you know. Lancaster County, man, what can you say? A beautiful place. I just don't get out there often. Um, but there's a mile-long covered bridge. And so the defenders of Wrightsville, they're actually going to place their cannons not in Wrightsville itself, but on the other side of that bridge um, in anticipation of the Confederates um, overrun their def defenses and try to cross the bridge. Um, what actually ends up happening is that they um, send some boats out with some axes to weaken the bridge um, to try to get it to uh, collapse after their troops do eventually evacuate. Um, when that doesn't work, they set fire to their own bridge. And a really, really funny story about the fire of the bridge at Wrightsville is that it's not the... There were some federal troops there. I believe the man in charge of the defense was a federal man as well. Um, and he orders for volunteers, for citizens to go out and strums it up, you know, help defend the north and the southern invasion and blah, blah, blah you know, we need to burn this bridge down to prevent their advance. So he gets some volunteer citizens to go out and burn the bridge down. Now, a bridge like that at the time is obviously very expensive. The company that owned it was making a lot of money off of it in tolls and whatnot. So when they went to get um, repaid, when they went to put in money, um, these claims with the federal government afterwards, the federal government said, now wait a minute, wait just a minute. We didn't burn it down. Private citizens burned it down. We don't owe you guys anything. So one of those kind of, and unfortunately that's that's a pretty frequent theme from a lot of people that put in to get uh, repaid by the federal government for destruction of property and whatnot. They either got extremely underpaid for what was destroyed, or it seems like the federal government found these loopholes where it's like, well, we didn't destroy it. That was destroyed by the Confederates. Or we didn't destroy it. That was destroyed by private citizens or, or so on and so forth. Um, but it's just kind of Weasley the way they did it. Either way, thank you so much for joining me for this brief video. The Surrender of York, really an interesting, interesting um, part of the Battle of Gettysburg. Not a lot of people discuss, um, not a lot of people know about, not a lot of people realize. Um, they know that Early marched out to Wrightsville. They know that he came back on modern day 234 through East Berlin and Dover and all that kind of stuff and they came down the Harrisburg Pike to attack um, but they don't know a lot about the details of that march out to Wrightsville and this is just one of those really interesting facts um, really these really interesting things about the Civil War about the Battle of Gettysburg the Gettysburg campaign so thank you so much for joining me I look so much forward to making videos for you guys discussing the Battle of Gettysburg getting out in the field showing you maybe some of the more off the beaten path kind of things. Um, again, my name is Aaron Smith. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a wonderful day.